Hey, I'm Logan, and this is part two of my series on the Sony A7R5. If you haven't seen my first video, I go over the gear that I used and some custom buttons for making shooting with it underwater a bit easier. I'll link it on the screen now if you want to check it out. So for part two, I'm just going to run through some photos and videos that I got and some general thoughts I have on the camera. This isn't going to be a super technical review, but if you're in the market for the camera, hopefully this will give you an idea of what you can get out of it. For a bit of context, I shoot mainly video. When I'm documenting trips or shoots, I'm switching between photo and video. And that's what appealed to me the most about the a7R5 is that it's a killer stills camera, but it also has the video abilities that Sony hasn't really put in their R-line cameras before. I've got six photos here, three are underwater and three are split shot over unders. They're not award winning photos, but this is mainly what I'm shooting when I document trips and they're pretty good examples of what I'm talking about. So here are the first three, and what made these stand out to me was that I probably wouldn't have gotten them without a fast autofocus. Then <laughs> this photo here is a good example. This is right as we surfaced from the drift dive, and below us was a group of, of nurse sharks resting in the seagrass, and everyone was so stoked to see them. This is Peach's face when we surfaced, and I think this shot just shows the excitement of the moment so well. And it's not something I would have been able to capture if the autofocus was hunting around the image and couldn't lock onto her face. And these other two shots were just moments that I saw and wanted to capture, and I'm glad that the camera was able to keep up. This shot is just one of those moments that I looked up and I, I saw this diver reaching for the ladder just flooded in sun rays, and I thought it would tell a good story, and I was able to capture exactly what I envisioned. It's not like the autofocus or 10 frames per second made the shot, but all of those things worked perfectly in the background. And as I'm sure a lot of you know, when those things don't work, it can be extremely frustrating. I also want to take a look at these split shots because for me, these were a bit more of an effort to get and less running gun than the other shots. My mode of operation was setting the focus area on center spot, cranking the burst rate up to high plus, kind of just pointing in the general direction and hoping for the best. Right at the surface, the waves are lapping against the dome. So the camera wants to focus on the water that's right in the front. So that's why the center spot is so important. I missed a lot of shots using other focus areas like wide that were hunting all around the picture while the subject was in the middle ground with waves all around them. And that's not a knock on the autofocus. It's just a time to know when to use the best settings to get the best result. I'll show you the burst sequence on the screen now. For me, this is just the easiest and fastest way to get the shot. And I don't have a ton of experience shooting over-unders, so I, I was just happy with what I got. If you're interested, all of these were shot in compressed RAW with file sizes around 65 megabytes. I don't have a need for anything higher. Most of my shots are gonna end up on social media and be completely crushed by compression anyways. Um, and I found that the compressed RAW gave me a lot of flexibility and uh, it was just the higher, highest quality I needed. There are higher quality options on this camera, um, so shoot on those if you if you want to. Just for me, the uh, compressed RAW was enough. All right, now I'm going to switch gears to video, which I shot a ton of, and I could probably go on and on about it, but I've got a few shots here that I'm happy with and I think demonstrate the camera's video capabilities. We've also got like a really short video with a bunch of sample footage from this trip in the a7R5 on our channel, so if you want to see more just in like a minute, it's really fast. Um, you can check that out. I'll link it on the screen now. Big selling point for me with this camera was the ability to shoot in 10-bit. I used to shoot on an A7R3, and I was disappointed when I started shooting more video that I could only record in 8-bit. So it's cool that this camera records a little bit more information. Here you can see I was able to bring out so much color and dynamic range in this shot after converting it from log. And this is just Sony's S-Log3 Rec. 709 LUT. You can download it from their website, and I haven't done much uh, color grading besides that. But what's great to see is the absence of any banding in the colors, which I find could happen when you're shooting the rich blue of the ocean. But for the most part, the camera handled the dramatic change in color really well, and, and I'm happy with this image. I also shot some standard color picture profile, mostly in 120 and 24 frames per second, and those came out nice. I like having a bit more flexibility with my final image, so I usually stick to log, but Sony colors are great, and you really can't go wrong when you're getting colors like this right out of the camera. Maybe just a little color boost to bring back some light and color that's lost to the water, but other than that, I think this looks really good. 
My first negative that I ran into was a weird amount of noise in some of my shots that I think that if it was shot on something like an A7S III, probably wouldn't have been there. It's common to get some noise in log, but this was showing up in the standard picture profile too, so I figured that would have been cleaner. I'm not sure what's going on, but I'm going to chalk it up to just being underwater and having less light along with a sensor that's pretty big, 60 megapixels. And usually the higher megapixel sensors aren't going to perform as well in low light. But the noise didn't really completely ruin anything. Uh, a lot of it's still usable. Just something I noticed. One thing to note, and you can learn from my mistakes here, is that if you're digging through the menu, changing a bunch of stuff, just double check that the camera's not changing another setting. There were times where I was switching from like 4K to HD or 10 bit to 8 bit. And then when I would try to switch back, it would change another setting or wouldn't change another setting along with it. Um, so just double check and be aware of what's changing in your camera because it can cause a bit of a mess if you're not fully aware of what your camera's doing. So the autofocus for video was like photos really fast and it worked, which is great because it wasn't something I had to really even think about. And it was basically point and shoot. I'd say I had a bit more issue when I was shooting at something like f2.8, but most of the time it did really well at tracking anything I put in front of it. Most of the time I was shooting at like f4, f5.6 or something like that, and there I had very little issues, maybe like one or two throughout the whole week. I'll throw a few more examples on the screen now of the autofocus tracking, because there were some moments that I was, I was really pleased with how well it tracked, especially some of the more macro shots. I, I just really like how they turned out. Another thing to mention is stabilization, which is really nice in this camera. It's got eight stops of image stabilization, which I found to be really smooth. And uh, I just made it a lot easier in post as well to stabilize and take out some of those micro jitters from swimming around. But overall, it was great and sometimes kind of hard to believe that it was handheld. So I didn't shoot any 8K this time around. I know it's a big feature talked about with this camera, but personally, at this point, I think it's a bit of a gimmick. Eventually, I think it'll be good to have, but right now it's limited to 24 frames per second, not the best codec, and I've seen some really bad rolling shutter. So it's just not practical for what I'm doing, and 4K works a lot better. If you want to have 8K footage or you want 8K footage to crop in or something like that, just make sure you have a fast enough card. Um, if you want to shoot the highest quality 8K internally, you'll need something faster than a V60 card. Or you can drop down to 200 and a V60 card should work. Well, those are my main takeaways after a week of shooting with the Sony a7R5. I really just scratched the surface of what this camera can do, so if you're looking to make the upgrade, I, I think you'd be making a good decision. Again, check out my other video on setting it up and some custom buttons for making shooting with it a lot easier. And as always, reach out to us if you have any questions. Thanks for watching and happy diving.